Hi everyone, um, I'm Josh Dunlop, I um, work for Jacobs, I'm an engineering geologist there. I've been there two years uh, since I graduated from the University of Leeds. Uh, and today I'm going to speak to you about the impact of groundwater, including uh, extreme weather and climate change on my project, the Middlewich Eastern Bypass. Um, some of you in the crowd may have put the words witch and uh, groundwater together and guess this might be about halite and you'd be correct. <laughs> so my agenda, um, quickly run through a bit of an introduction to the, the project. I'll talk about the ground model uh, and the groundwater models. I'll then go through about um, the impact the groundwater has had on the site to date. I'll then talk about the potential future impacts that we may see in the future and round up with a bit of a conclusion. So the project, like I said, is the Middlewich Eastern Bypass. It is approximately um, three kilometres of new highway to the south and east of Middlewich Town Centre in Cheshire. Um, there is, it's mostly at grade, um, sort of small embankments and cuttings. However, there are two um, bridges towards the south of the scheme there in that blue box. One that crosses over the Northwich Sandbach Railway and one that crosses the Trent Mersey Canal. Um, and the parties, according to CDM regs, are Cheshire East Highways as the client. We have Balfour Beatties and Ringway Jacobs as the principal contractors. And we have ourselves, Jacobs, as the designer. Um, from the offset, I have to say that there is some confidentiality issues um, and restrictions on what I can say, as this project is in, uh, ongoing at the moment. So at the start of the job, we looked at the freely available data um, available to us. And that uh, diagram on the right hand side shows uh, a strat column. Beneath Middlewich, you can see that there is two um, significant thicknesses of halite. We've got the Wilkersley and the Northwich, and they are sandwiched between mudstones um, of the Mercy Mudstone Group, namely the Brooks Mill, the Witch, and the Byerley Mudstones. Um, in particular, to Middlewich, we're concentrating on the top two there, the Brooks, uh, Brooks Mill and the Wilkersley halite. The diagram on the left is a section through Middlewich, which is similar to what we have. Um, we have this collapsed strata, uh, residual strata of the Brooks Mill mudstone over this area of wet rockhead um, of the Wilkersley halite. And before we did any sort of in intrusive investigations, we determined that the, uh, the main di uh, risk, geohazard, to the site would be voids, uh, particularly sort of semi static voids within the Wilkersley halite, which may permeate the uh, surface. So a bit about dissolution then, um, there are five main karstic rocks in the UK, um, they are uh, dolomite, limestone, chalk, gypsum and salt. Uh, that diagram on the left hand side there shows uh, in the Cheshire Basin we are underlain by Triassic salt and gypsiferous rocks. Um, if you just go to the right hand side of that same diagram you can see that salt karst and gypsum karst have the highest dissolution rates uh, and, and increased dis dissolution as well. Um, this, to quantify this a little bit, um, halite has a solubility of about 350 grams per litre, um, which is two orders of magnitude higher than gypsum and three orders of magnitude higher than limestone. A lot of us will probably know this already subconsciously. If you've ever put salt in your sibling's glass at the dinner table, it disappears pretty quickly. If you did the same with limestone, you'd probably get a whack around the head. Um, for everyone else who's well behaved at the dinner table, we have a video on the right hand side which may show this. Hopefully that works. Oh no, it doesn't. Um, basically, that video would have shown um, with similar ground models to what we have at Middlewich. Oh, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, could you mind muting that? Sorry, I'll explain over it. Thank you. Um, yeah, so a similar ground model to Middlewich, we have um, sort of a granular layer above this sand, which would represent the Brooks Mill mudstone, and we have this white layer beneath, which would obviously be our Wilkesley halite. Uh, and as fresh water is introduced into the system, uh, you can see that the salt disappears and that void space is occupied by the overlying strata and there is surface deformation. I'll just let that play out. Thank you. Um, we also did a bit of a quick experiment on site. Um, we had two lumps of similarly sized core samples from the Wilkesley Halite. Uh, the sample on the left there was put into a bucket of brine and the sample on the right was originally the same sort of size um, and was put into a bucket of fresh water. 
After a couple of hours, we came back, um, and obviously the results speak for themselves there. You can see the, the sample on the right-hand side has significantly shrunk, um, and we actually think that it's only stopped shrinking further because the water had reached saturation point. Uh, and you can see, hopefully, that there's some sort of orange crystals of halite still within that sample. So basically what we're trying to conclude here is that these are rapid, um, this can happen really rapidly if conditions allow. Um, but the towns of Cheshire are not disappearing at rates of sort of centimetres and metres per day. Um, so what have we got as current conditions? This diagram is uh, what we think is happening with the groundwater model um, beneath Middlewich. So we know that there's the relative density of a fully saturated brine is approximately 1.2 compare that to fresh water, which is one, um, we assume that therefore there's a sort of interaction uh, where the fresh water floats above the uh, saturated brines, um, similar to sort of how oil slick uh, sort of floats above uh, fresh water. Within the ground model then, we have sort of 10 metres of glacial till, 50 metres of Brooks Mill mudstone, and anything below 60 metres below ground level was Wilkersley halite. And somewhere within the Brooks Mill, we have this interface where the fresh water above uh, floats above the, the sort of saturated brines, and this prevents further dissolution occurring within the Wilkersley and the, the lower portion of the Brooks Mill mudstone. Um, so we, we sort of like understand that there's this protective blanket. Um, we need to understand then how previous dissolution occurred in the past. And to do that, we go way back to the Triassic, when these rocks originally formed, uh, in the fault-bound basin of the modern-day Treasure Basin, um, during the break of the Pangaea. This basin would have had influxes of salt water um, and as the salt water evaporated that would leave behind these, um, these halite crystals um, which would eventually form the thick successions of halite we have. And then there'd also be occasional windblown sediments which caused the, um, the build up of these mudstones. At some point between then and now, um, if there's any fresh water in, um, induced into the system, they could potentially cause dissolution uh, within either the Brooks Mill or the Wilkersley Halite, and um, this fresh water would then potentially open up small voids um, within, within the Wilkersley. We can sort of imagine two scenarios. There's like localised and regional um, dissolution. Localised may result in uh, human activity, for example, where brine pumping um, forces water being pumped for industrial reasons to flow towards a certain point. As it's, the water is flowing, it will obviously choose the path of least resistance. Uh, and obviously it's far easier to flow through a void than it is through salt and rock. Um, any water that is then pumped through this, this pathway, uh, if there's any undersaturated groundwater, it makes this void bigger until um, the overlying strata can no longer bridge it. When it can't bridge it, it collapses into the void and causes this upwards migration of the um, of, of the, the, the void. Sorry, um, and this is eventually leads to a surface expression um, on, on a sort of smaller localized scale. In a regional sense, if we have a widespread um, a, a widespread drop in the brine interface that I mentioned a minute ago, this leads to far more of the halite being susceptible to dissolution. Uh, therefore, far more voids, far more collapse, far more surface deformation. Let's put a bit more context on it then. So, Cheshire has been uh, a centre of, of brine exploitation for, for centuries, uh, sort of especially between the 1800s and the 1970s. Uh, extraction was uncontrolled and unregulated, uh, and the result was frequent catastrophic collapse. I don't imagine the residents of them houses bought them like that, so this is probably evidence of uh, localised subsidence. Um, in a regional context, it's a bit different. We think that the, the lowering of the brine interface actually occurred during uh, the retreat of the, the recent glaciers in the Pleistocene. So this diagram on the left shows the current configuration we have at Middlewich, um, which is the brine interface well above the level of wet rockhead at the top of the halite. And um, obviously, there's far less uh, halite being um, dis dissolved at this point. On the right is what we think happened during the glaciation uh, and the retreat of the wet base glaciers during the Pleistocene. There is uh, the water table and the, the, the groundwater head of water was sufficient enough to push the brine interface down to deeper levels. 
uh, expose a lot more of the halite to the solution. These would then cause, like I said before, more voids, more voids, more collapse, more surface deformation. So did we find any evidence of either localised or regional substance during our ground investigation? Um, localised substance was probably best exhibited during our non-intrusive investigations. This picture on the left here is a microgravity survey um, done in Middlewich. Just for reference, that little brown mark down there is the railway, and this is just to the northeast of it. The blue area is a negative residual boogie anomaly, and it uh, indicates that the, the ground at this area is less dense than the surrounding sort of reds and orange colours. We also did <coughs> seismic surveys. So this is along seismic line L2 that you can see on the microgravity. Um, just to put a little bit of context on this as well, our chainage 100 on this seismic line roughly correlates to the centre of that um, blue area. And on the refraction surveys, we've got a bit of interpretation there at 100 chainage. Um, this sort of these shallow, uh, poor refractions. We also did reflection along the same line, um, and this was probably our, our biggest indicator and our most obvious indicator uh, of localised subsidence. The yellow line uh, at about 60 metres is the top of the halite. Uh, you can see that it's broken at about chainage 100 and not as strong. There's also this area of, of strong reflections and, and sort of disturbed reflections uh, at chainage 100. And there's a, a vertical fault alongside it. Um, hypothetically, the freshwater may have used this as a pathway to get down to uh, the top of the halite and the collapse in an upward fashion to the ground surface. Um, funnily enough, when we went to site for walkovers, there was no sign of this blue area. Um, it was originally marked on historical maps as a pond. However, when we got to site, there was no evidence of it. It was only from our, our intrusive, uh, non-intrusive geophysics that we found this. For whatever reason, the farmer just didn't want a two and a half metre hole in his uh, field. In terms of regional subsidence, um, it was probably best exhibited in our intrusive investigation. The picture on the right is a typical example of the Brooks Mill mudstone core that we recovered. Um, it's sort of small millimetre to centimetre clasts within a muddy matrix on sort of the right hand side of it. Um, and it also varies to sort of class supported uh, breaches on, on the left hand side far less than the money matrix, depending on how disturbed and, and how weathered the samples were. We also have evidence of sort of secondary precipitation of um, minerals as well. Uh, the pictures on the left, um, that fracture within the, the grey zone on the second core down, we have um, what we think is re-precipitated halite. The halite further down in the sequence was a bit more pure and uh, translucent and, and sort of pinky in colour. Whereas this stuff um, seems to sort of incorporate maybe um, impurities and, and clastic material um, where it's been originally dissolved and uh, re precipitated at a different depth. Just a bit of a recap then of what I've said. Um, regional dissolution has occurred and, and this has caused the, the, the majority of the collapse breccia. And there's also anthropogenically induced uh, dissolution which has possibly led to um, localised subsidence features across our site as well. Um, so, I mean, fortunately, we have found no evidence of pre-existing voids, which is our, our main worry at the start of the GI. Um, but how about the future? So we have previous dissolution methods and uh, mechanisms. How do we assess the impact going forward then? Well, to do this, we use Hutton's principle of uniformitarianism. Uh, the present is key to the past, and in our case, key to the future as well. We know that in the past, the main mechanism for dissolution and surface def uh, deformation is the alteration of the protective brine blanket. So what is our design going to do that could potentially alter this uh, blanket? I think Tony Waltham said in the 2015 Glossop lecture, control the drainage. This is something we can control as part of uh, de our design process. For example, we've been in communication with our drainage team quite a lot. Uh, and we've said under no circumstances are suds ponds, uh, suds ponds have to be lined, sorry. Under no circumstances are we to have soakaways that lead directly into the, the ground surface. We used brine during our ground investigation as a flush, um, and we backfilled any boreholes that penetrated into the Wilkesley. This is just to 
reduce the easy pathways for fresh water to percolate down to the halide. Um, we're also in sort of a difficult period of dynamic climate change at the moment. Um, there's a lot of unknowns that we have to try and factor into our design as well. Again, we've been speaking with our, our drainage team and they've accounted for a one in 100 year event for capacity for all our culverts, all our flood compensation areas, all of our drainage ditches. Um, however, we've also factored in resilience into this in terms of climate change, especially in the northwest of England. It's already quite a wet region. The unknowns in the next 100, 120 years uh, in terms of sort of surface water availability uh, is what is that is an unknown. So they've actually factored the designs by 1.35 on top of this as well to account for any sort of excess um, rainfall in the, in the next sort of years. We also have to acknowledge though that there is this latent background risk of developing above dis um, soluble strata. It is a natural process and we can control as much as we want, but it is a natural process and there is always this blatant background risk. So just before I summarise everything, I'll explain this diagram, uh, this picture on the right. This is the seismic truck that was used to do the seismic surveys that I showed a few slides ago. This is actually next to the Trent and Mersey Canal and the rest of our site sort of goes in a northeast direction into the page there. I just found it funny that this building in the background, this grey ominous industrial building overlooking us when the entire time we are on site is actually owned and operated by British Salt who are actively pumping salt out of the ground, uh, brine out of the ground at the moment. So it was, a, it was a nice reminder every time you got to site that we were investigating something that they may well have caused. Um, so just to summarise, the impact uh, of groundwater has been profound on Middlewich. Um, the changes in the groundwater regime have led to dissolution uh, of the Wilkesley Halite member. In turn, this has caused um, collapse in the overlying Brooks Mill. And our ground investigation broadly agrees with this hypothesis. Um, and we have to acknowledge that there is always this latent background risk associated with soil strata despite controlling what we can in terms of design. So just to conclude then, groundwater has had a profound impact on the surface geomorphology and the subsurface characteristics of the stratigraphy beneath Middlewich. Um, understanding the geological and groundwater processes that have induced historical dissolution is fundamental in, our, in, in assessing the risk of a future substance on our site. Thank you very much.